Uh, good morning, industry colleagues. Jolly, jolly nice to see you uh, on this uh, early Tuesday morning. Um, uh, as, as we often say, uh, the tech breakfasts. The tech breakfasts are engineering fundamentals. Um, uh, and if you come to Jigsaw um, uh, in uh, Golden Square, um, sort of later in the day for any events we do, sort of daytime and evening, uh, they're more um, sort of application and uh, and product related. But but the morning, you know, the early morning uh, events, the tech breakfasts are always um, very focused on uh, engineering fundamentals, um, sort of signal standards, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is a part two. This is this is a follow up to one we did last month. Um, um, about uh, Fibre Optic 101, where we talked a lot about the difference between single and multi-mode fibre and, and, and all the technologies surrounding how we send things over optical cable. Uh, and, uh, and if you didn't see it, uh, my colleague Wesley did some live fibre splicing, so you can see how the, uh, the, uh, the, the core alignment, uh, the cladding alignment, core alignment fusion machine worked. Uh, and, uh, so, but today uh, we're moving that on a bit, uh, and we're talking about uh, CWDM and DWDM, wave division multiplexing how you can stack up multiple uh, uh, signals and send them down a fibre. Um, so just a, a, bit, a bit of a recap. Uh, as I say, uh, last, last time we talked about uh, single versus multi-mode. The fundamental differences between those two technologies, I mean, if you think about the way a signal travels down a twisted pair audio cable and the way a signal travels down a piece of coaxial cable, uh, that is not as big a difference as the difference between single and multi-mode cable. Uh, but once we're out of the sort of the, the, the cheap end of the market, the multi-mode way of doing things, the sort of the SAN, the, 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 the campus, the sort of on-premises type fibre, and we're into the real um, hero of, of, of the technology, single mode, we start talking about um, uh, wave division multiplexing, stacking up many, many signals down a single fibre. Uh, and, and, and the two technologies uh, in play are CWDM, coarse wave division multiplexing, and dense wave division multiplexing, DWDM. And, um, you know, they, they, that they, um, uh, they, they really are quite, they, they differ uh, by the kind of cost of implementing them. So this is kind of where we live, uh, it's sort of uh, TV and facilities and, and, and things like that. And this is where sort of telcos and ISPs live and some very wealthy uh, uh, film and TV type people live. Uh, but we'll be principally talking about CWDM today with a bit of reference to DWDM and how it differs. And got a little demo of, of the, um, the optical uh, equipment that we sell, Barnfind, Norwegian manufacturer, who we, we, we love greatly. And, and they've been a fantastic solution in lots of different um, uh, applications that we never even realised were kind of needing. Uh, this kind of thing. Uh, and so whether it's campus-wide connectivity or uh, your facility to your data centre, and that's been a hot thing for the last year, um, uh, the amount of time that, uh, that me and my colleagues, particularly Mr McGuinness at the back there, spend at, uh, at Volta in, in Farringdon getting deafened by the air conditioning is, is uh, kind of increasing week on week. Um, outside broadcast uh, and, 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 and uh, Sympathy Optical Triax uh, uh, working is something Barnfind have had great success with. And uh, facility to facility connectivity. Uh, you know, ever since we were brought into the gentle embrace of, of Jigsaw 24, um, uh, Route 6 and Jigsaw 24, we now have fibre connectivity between our premises. And, uh, and, and that's kind of, you know, if we're doing demos and things like that, is the media composer sitting over in Ward or Muse? Is it in Volta or is it here? You know, nobody really knows and, and you don't really have to. And we'll talk a bit about the Dolby 4K uh, CinemaNet project, uh, which we did last year, and, and how that's linking uh, numerous Soho facilities to Dolby's uh, super expensive million pound Eclipse projector, where people can um, uh, finish their films in just the best viewing room in the world, uh, and, and, and how we implemented that. So just a, uh, just a, a quick uh, uh, recap on, on, on why this all has to be single mode, why, why multi-mode fibre doesn't really come into this. Um, uh, you know, and those fundamental differences, single mode cable relying on that nine micron wide transmissive core, whereas multi-mode cable relies on typically a 50 micron core. And the way they send signals down the core, um, multi-mode implements um, uh, many modes of the same wavelength of light, whereas single mode is at liberty to send multiple wavelengths of light down the same cable. And uh, uh, you know, if you if you look at the um, uh, the, the output of a multi-mode cable on on a uh, on a, a spectral analyzer, you, you get these sort of mode patterns coming out at the end of the cable. All of them are 850 nanometer wavelength, uh, but uh, by using something akin to a um, uh, 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 a sort of a modal interference receiver, you can, you can derive a, an XY uh, constellation pattern and, and figure out what data was pushed in at the cable at the other end. But of course, of course the limitation of all this is that 
Um, you've got uh, uh, modal dispersion going on down the cable. The, the, the wavelengths are being smeared. And so these patterns become less and less distinct at the other end of the cable and harder and harder to recover. So typically we're limited to 500 meters for OM3 and 1500 meters when we get into graded index fiber. Um, and, and, and that's the summary of that. Modal dispersion, that's the enemy when you're talking about multi-mode fiber, in-premises fiber. But uh, the, by far the better technology for, for, for adopting these, these uh, you know, much denser data rates down the cable is single mode fiber and uh, works in an entirely different way. Uh, the light is optimally constrained within that nine micron core. Uh, there's none of that total internal reflection going on, uh, which is how multi-mode works. And, uh, you know, much higher data rates and much higher distances. When we're talking CWDM, packing passively multiple wavelengths onto a cable, 80 kilometers is our limit. But when you get to DWDM, you know, 1,000 kilometers is not unusual. And that's how the transatlantic cables work, um, uh, where you've got many thousands of kilometers you've got to span across an ocean. So the Russians Yeah, or, or sharks. Um, uh, single mode fiber, by definition, long range technology, uh, and, and so it may well be hard to put in more cable. Why, you know, why would you want to um, you know, spend money on, on multiplexers to be able to pack your fiber more efficiently? Well, it may just be difficult to get more cores of fiber uh, between two places. Um, the internal IT department may have control over the fiber network, and as we've discovered at a couple of uh, football clubs, um, the internal IT department are not friendly to the, the TV departments. Where, where have you heard that before? <laughs> so, I mean, in the case of Arsenal, um, uh, they have Highbury House and they have the stadium. There's about nine, 900 metres of, of, of cable distance between the two. And um, the IT department gave them a single pair of, 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 of fibres between the two premises. And, and they had to use that to extend their BT facility line so they could, they could take a feed from the host broadcaster and they could play back out against the network. Um, but when we showed them all this stuff, their kind of eyes lit up and they said, what, you mean we can extend a 10 gig network back to the stadium? We can do this, we can do that, we can extend our SDI router, you know, ATAP puts some RSDI router over to our edit suites and, and it was a revelation for them. Similarly with Chelsea, uh, Ch Chelsea only had two fibres between their studio at, uh, at Stamford Bridge and the studio that controls the big screens and the LED boards around the, around the pitch. And, and, and by deploying this, we were able to give them a load of options of, of extending studios and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if a metro network crosses a local authority boundary, um, uh, in England at least, uh, you're liable for a tax on, on the number of cores that you've got crossing that boundary. And so rather than, rather than paying an ongoing, never-ending tax uh, for, for, for additional cores of fibre, surely the better thing is to, is, to, is to stack up some signals on your existing fibre. And as we said, we're going to talk about CWDM and DWDM. But this is, this is CWDM and how it kind of lays out. In one slide, if you, if you can kind of, if you can grok this one slide, you've, you, know, you know as much as anybody. Um, uh, so CWDM uh, typically comes in 8, 16, 8, 16 and 18 uh, channel variants. And rather splendidly, the channels, uh, uh, you, you know, they coexist. So if you started off with a, with a cheap little eight channel multiplex, like I've got over on the bench over there, um, you know, you could combine that, or you could take that out and replace it with a 16 channel, and, and none of your optics would have to change, and the channels are entirely sort of compatible with each other. Um, but they start up at 1270 nanometers, and they run to 1610 nanometers, and you can see kind of, you know, sort of in the sort of upper region there <coughs> is, is 1310, which is where most of our kind of single mode stuff goes on. So if, if you've got a, um, if you've uplinked two switches over a, over a fiber, it, the uplink is probably running at 1310 nanometers, non-CWDM, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's this ability to have 20 nanometer channel spacing and passive optical multiplexes that allow you to, 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 to put multiple uh, wavelengths onto a single fiber that really is the power behind this. And there's the kind of all the specifications, you know, how much um, uh, return loss there is, um, uh, expected, uh, you know, channel isolation and all this kind of stuff. And these are kind of, you know, down there at, at, uh, 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 at sort of values that are very sort of uh, compatible with the neg 28 dBs of signal to noise that we expect from good quality optics. Um, yeah, there you go. Just specifications and the obligatory ITU um, uh, standard number. So there's a sort of little diagrammatic representation of a, of a 16 channel uh, multiplex. It's got a common port and 18 um, uh, holes. And they can be ins and they can be outs, because remember, this is entirely passive uh, in, in its nature. 
and what kind of engineer would I be if I hadn't busted the lid off one of these things to have a look inside? <laughs> and that's what a multiplexer looks like inside. There's no electronics at all. Uh, all those individual fibre cores combine uh, uh, through um, little dichroic filters that basically filter out the 20 nanometer channels and then they all combine into, a, in, into a, 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 an optical combiner to give you the common output. And so whether you're plucking off a frequency as if the individual frequencies are outputs or whether you're injecting a frequency regarding them as inputs it works the same there's no there's no difference between an input and an output if you think about uh, if i was using maybe two of those channels for ethernet a uh, 10 gig ethernet connection a send and a receive uh, of course all the time there's data going up the cable is coming down the cable or in this case there's data going up the wavelength is coming back down on another wavelength uh, and so there is no fundamental difference between inputs and outputs on a, on a fiber multiplex and, uh, you know, look at that. It's, it's just a, a splendid piece of, well, I mean, it, it looks like a bit of a bodge, doesn't it? It's the kind of thing that a bad wireman would do. But it's, 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 it's just optical engineering. There's no electronics in there whatsoever. And our typical expectation through that is of about 2.5 dBs of loss. Remember, we've got about 28 dBs of signal-to-noise to play with. So, you know, you could put a few of those in the path. Uh, you know, you could pluck a frequency off, maybe inject a new frequency before you had to start worrying about your optical budget. And uh, who could ever resist the, uh, the op opportunity to put in a, uh, a, a, you know, the, the front cover of Dark Side of the Moon? But it's, you think about it like a prism. We're splitting out a bunch of wavelengths or we're combining a bunch of wavelengths uh, to, to, to the common white light, if you will. Now, the multiplexer is only one side of this bit of cleverness. The other side of this is, is the optics that you put into your network switch, into your barn find router, into your back of your black magic router. Uh, and the optics have to, you have to think about this and, 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 and figure out and use the right optics. So this is, this is how barn find mark their optics, but it's much the same with the, 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 the one hung low brand Sengen specials you get from Fiber Store. Um, if, if you look at the, uh, um, uh, the, the part number on barn find, you can see you know, what the wavelength is of the optic and you can see what, what, what um, distance the optic's rated to. I mean, in this case, it's 10 kilometers. That's just reflective of the signal to noise performance of the optic. And, uh, uh, and so by careful choice of, of, of optical um, SFPs, there's a bunch here, I'll just send those around, you can have a look at those. Um, you, can, you, can, you can then plan how you're going to populate your fiber, how you're going to um, uh, send the wavelengths up, up and down the fiber. So most SFPs are transceivers. They send and they receive. You know, obviously, if you, if you plug an SFP into your network switch, you want something that can send Ethernet traffic as well as receive Ethernet traffic. You can buy cheaper SFPs that are only transmitters or only receivers, but for the most part, SFPs are transceivers. Uh, and in the case of CWDM SFPs, their outputs are set for a tuned wavelength. So uh, I think in the case of the ones that I'm, I'm showing today carrying this video signal up and down this fiber many times, um, I've, I've gone between 1290 and 1350 nanometers. They're the ones I pulled out the box when I was setting this up this morning. The important thing to remember is that all SFPs are colorblind on their inputs. They don't care what wavelength they receive. And that's how this all kind of works, really. If you've got an SFP that's sat in, an opt in, in a network switch and it's sending out data on, say, 1350 nanometers, what comes back can't be on 1350 nanometers because that wavelength's already used. Its transmission side is already used. It basically has to be able to receive on whatever wavelength comes out of the multiplexer back into the SFP. So we say that SFPs are colorblind on their inputs. They don't care what wavelength they get back on their inputs. Uh, and, and Ethernet being the example. And the optics are, are really the only limit on, 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 on the, 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 uh, the, that wavelength's bandwidth. So today we talk about 10 gig optics, uh, and they're the kind of expensive SFPs, although they're a darn sight cheaper this year than they were last year. Um, uh, uh, and whether you've put a 1 gig SFP, a 3 gig video rated SFP, or a 10 gig SFP, or a 16 gig fiber channel SFP, it's, it's the optic that limits the bandwidth. There's nothing fundamentally limiting about the fiber. Um, a a single-mode fiber has, to all practical intents and purposes, it has limitless bandwidth. I mean, that's a stupid thing to say if you know anything about sort of information theory and Shannon and things like that. But 
from our practicality point of view, if you look at the, the sort of like the, the wavelength and the channel spacings and, and, and you push it through the equations, we're talking about terahertz of bandwidth down each wavelength. So there's fundamentally, from our, you know, 12 gig video, 16 gig fiber channel, 40 gig ethernet point of view, there's practically limitless bandwidth available down a fiber. And it's only how our optics behave that really govern the limitations this year. <coughs> So here's a, here's a very typical example uh, how we might have populated a fibre. Uh, so, so, so there's the, uh, the, the spectrum at the top, uh, ranging from uh, 1270 to 1610. So this is an 18 channel multiplex. And the, uh, the blue ones are wavelengths that are going one way up the fibre, and the red ones are wavelengths that are coming back up the fibre. And that's just a sort of diagrammatic representation. And this is the kind of thing that we do all the time when customers are saying, yep, I need to, I need to I have a single core of fibre and I need to pack it this way between two sites. How, you know, how are we going to lay that out? How are we going to do that? And, uh, but they are just numbers after all. You, know, you could put the videos at one end and the networks at the other end. You could interleave them if you wanted to. There's no fundamental uh, conflict. There's, you know, no wavelength is better than any other. Um, People talk about uh, our waterfall effect, where, where um, at certain wavelengths you get a drop off of, a te of you know, there's attenuation in the fibre. That's kind of almost gone. Uh, they've figured out how to manufacture fibre well enough now that that's not really a consideration. Um, so here we go. Uh, having uh, sort of banged on about all of this, it's probably worth uh, just kind of showing you some typical applications. Um, the, the nice thing about BarnFind, and we've been selling them for a couple of years now, and we've been over to their factory in Norway, and we get on with them very well. They're a very good partner company, uh, is that they are entirely agnostic for parts that they don't manufacture. They'll sell you uh, uh, SFPs, and if you notice, most of those SFPs in that tray I sent round had the BarnFind logo on. They're just rebranded fibre store ones. Um, but they're entirely happy for you to put any MSA-compliant SFP into their equipment. Um, and, 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 and that's also borne out by the fact that they'll talk to any blinking routing panel as well. So look, there's a cheap and cheerful 200 odd quid Blackmagic panel there, uh, which I can use to drive the router inside the barn find very easily. Um, and uh, who would have thought you could use a, a Blackmagic panel to, uh, to route fiber channel or to route MADI or something like that. But you know, there, there you go. I'll show you that working in a minute. Um, We'll talk about Barn Studio, which is BarnFind's management software, and, and, and some of the power behind that. And that proved very useful in, in the case of the Dolby uh, project we did last year. And uh, you know, integration with other things is, is, is exemplary. <coughs> so what you're seeing before you here is a, is a, a, a BarnFind 1U chassis, which is their 32 squared data agnostic router. Um, yeah, you can run anything through this. You can run um, you know, Ethernet, fiber channel, uh, MADI, uh, AES, SDI, HDMI, whatever you like. It's entirely agnostic as the signals that run through it. And the way with this one is configured, it's configured with 16 SFP holes. Um, it's, got, it's got a video top board in it. And each one, well, I say a video top board, it's got a BNC top board. Depending on how you configure it, these BNCs could be MADI, or they could be video, or you know, whatever you want them to be. And also, I've got a passive multiplexer in here as well. And then, uh, imagine, if you will, this is not just a, a five meter bit of fiber, but this is an 80 kilometer fiber. And uh, this is in Slough or Milton Keynes or wherever your data center is. Uh, and, and at the other end, I've got another passive multiplexer uh, with its common port connected to the common port of that one. And I've got a couple of barn finds, uh, barn minis as they're called, little, little um, SFP to copper uh, adapter units. And these ones just happen to be BNC in and out. In that order, you know, uh, and, and but they, they do variations on this. They 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 have um, they have ones that are just two SFPs. So you can configure them as you like. The SFPs and HDMI or or, or RS forty two GPIs, twelve gig, gig video. Uh, you know, they they come in multiple flavors, so you can break out whatever signal types you like. And you can kind of imagine that that kind of in the uh, this is the kind of thing that gets Velcro to the back of the monitor in the edit suite or, or you know the remote facility, whatever. And then uh, I've got uh, hanging off one of the the barn minis. I've got this little. Um, Boland camera monitor. 1,000 thousand nits this monitor can do. It's almost an HDR monitor. Um, uh, but, um, and, and so the way I've configured the system is that I've got, uh, coming out of this little Blackmagic playback box, <coughs> I've got video coming in on, on, on this port here. I have, in the GUI, defined that port to be an input. Uh, and so you can see it's highlighted in green, so, so, so it can see a signal there. And if we go and look at the outputs, we can see, uh, or we'll go and look at the matrix, you can see I've got um, uh, that BNC routed to all the outputs. So it's, it's, it's available on all the outputs, SFPs and BNCs. Um, 
but actually what I've got is uh, the second SFP uh, has got the return from the far end and I've routed that back up the fibre to, to the far end. So, so, so the video from the Blackmagic is coming into the router here. It's being routed up this fibre into the multiplex, you know, on a wavelength, up to the demultiplexer, into the first, um, no, into this um, barn mini, being turned back into copper, being sent back into this barn mini, back up the fibre, through the router, back on the fibre again, back into this one, and you're seeing it on the monitor. So, Although it looks like I'm only extending one video feed up here, I've actually got the same video going up, down, and back up again. So, so you know, we're, we're, we've populated three wavelengths on this fibre. It's being particularly underused. You know, we can have a bunch of 10 gig ethernets and some fibre channel and a few other things on there as well. But for the purposes of the demonstration, you can see, you know, it's working. And if I, uh, if I, if I do a take on the little black magic panel there, you can see we've lost our video. If I go back to the, uh, the first input, our video's back again. So this took no effort for me. I literally just plugged this in, in the black magic utility. I said, here's the IP address of the router, and the router understands black magic protocol. In fact, it's very simple. It's, it's just telnet protocol. But, but it, 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 it shows that, you know, kind of whatever you want to integrate with is, is pr they've probably already done it. They've probably already integrated it, whether you've got ProBell panels or, uh, uh, you know, numerous other uh, router standards. Um, so, you know, they've been very responsive in, in, in their sort of dealings with the industry. So that's, it's a router. It's a data agnostic router. It, there's a CWDM passive multiplexer in there as, already. I'm routing video up, down, up the fiber. You can see it being broken out the other end, displayed on the little monitor over there. And here's a diagrammatic representation of, of, of the router. And, uh, and, and we can also drive the router via the, the Blackmagic panel. Uh, if I go to the SFP tab here, I can look at um, how some of these SFPs are performing. So there's the first SFP, uh, which is the one that is sending and receiving video back again. Uh, and we can see uh, there's our RX power in DBMs. So we've lost about uh, five uh, DBMs through the process. And that's just the, the loss incurred by the two optical multiplexers. This is kind of rather splendid from a status point of view. When we did the Dolby um, 4K cinema network, um, the deal was that various facilities around town can send quad video along with several other signal types to Dolby's um, Eclipse projector room. Uh, and there were numerous occasions where, you know, so-and-so at Technicolor would be saying, yeah, no, we're sending you 4K. And because we'd returned the remote configuration network back to Dolby on all the remote barn find units around town, uh, AD or Ian or whoever at Dolby was able to look in and say, no, 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 I can only see video coming in on one input. I can't see quad video. You're lying. Please go back and check your base light. That it really is sticking out uh, 4K video and not just HD video. So that was a, a kind of a nice little um, extra for that. So back to Keynote. Uh, but CWDM only goes so far. Um, the proper money uh, gets behind DWDM. And whereas CWDM has a channel spacing of 20 nanometers, that's, that's where the wavelengths are placed next to each other, DWDM, by contrast, there's two standards, can either space its channels at 0.8 nanometers or 0.4 nanometers, which kind of gives you a massive 92 or even 100. 96 or, or a massive 192 channels on a fibre. Uh, and it can go a thousand kilometres without amplification, uh, which is how all the, the, the undersea uh, uh, fibre cables work. However, uh, the signals are single direction. So if you've got one fibre, you can only send things up it. Uh, you, can't, you can't send and receive on a single fibre. And this is a limitation of, of, of this technology called erbium doped fibre amplification. Uh, because it uses, it doesn't, you know, if you think about how a fibre amplifier has to work, the idea of having to convert 96 or 192 signals all back to an electrical signal, regenerate them, you know, tidy up all the rising and falling edges of that signal, and then re turn it back into, fi into fibre would be just prohibitively expensive. That would just, you know, you need racks of equipment. It couldn't be done. And so an erbium dope fibre amplifier uses um, uh, the whole kind of a laser emissive uh, amplification process. It's actually amplifying the electrons. It's bringing the electrons back up out of the noise. It's, it's, sorry, the photons. Oh, that's, that's wrong, isn't it? It's bringing the photons back about, back, back about the noise floor and, and, and kind of sending them on their way again. You know, if, if you know, all engineers know that, 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 that um, you know, cables basically put noise onto signals. You, you know, you unplug your guitar and turn up the amplifier. You know, what, what you hear, the buzz coming out of the amplifier is, is electrons colliding in the cable. It's called Johnson noise. And, and, you know, there are reasons why 
entropy is, is considered the zeroth law of thermodynamics. You, you, know, you know, noise on a cable is just a fundamental fact of life. And the clever thing about uh, EDFAs is, 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 is that they can boost up the signal without having to turn it back into an electrical signal again. They can do it at the, at the optical level. And so they're kind of they're boosting up the photons, sending them on their way again. But unlike CWDM, uh, everything relies on very finely calibrated lasers, you know, 0.4 nanometer channel spacing. Um, and it's, it, this really is a quite recent innovation. The, the, the first transatlantic fiber cable, TAT-8, uh, uh, back in 1988, you know, it was limited to sort of 250 megabits per second. Um, you know, so it couldn't even take standard def video. <laughs> um, uh, but in 1996, TAT-12 um, uh, was the first transatlantic cable to have um, uh, EDFAs along its, along its path. It could actually boost up DWDM traffic and, and, and carry it all the way between um, um, Land's End and uh, I think it's Iceland. It terminates before it goes to New York. Um, but I mean, this is all very super expensive stuff. I've got, I've got a friend who's a project manager on the, um, he's a project manager at AT&T and he's done his time on the AT&T fiber ship. And, you know, to lay a new transatlantic cable is half a billion dollars. You know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous money. Uh, but, but, but uh, you know, so consequently, between buildings in London, it's almost always cheaper to buy more cores. Uh, or within buildings, um, it's, it's always cheaper to run in more cores. Uh, and, 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 you know, you always have to sort of budget these things against, you know, do I, do I invest a couple of grand in CWDM multiplexers? Or is it just cheaper to run in some more cores of fiber? Um, and the nice thing is that when, you, when, you, when, when EU networks or somebody run you a fiber between your building and their point of presence to get you to Volta or, or Equinix or whatever other data center you want to use, they'll always give you two cores. And so you can either populate the second core with a bunch of other wavelengths and get twice as many things, or you can use the second core as a, as a, as a, as a failover. Um, Outside broadcast, uh, Barnfind have, 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 have done lots in the sort of SMPT camera triacs, uh, optical triacs sort of area. Um, uh, if you consider that uh, an optical triax cable to connect your uh, nice uh, you know, Sony F55 camera to its base station, um, uh, you know, the, the, the standard one you get with the camera channel is however long it is, 30 meters. But if you're doing a golf OB and you need uh, you know, a kilometer long triax, optical triax, uh, you know, th those cables kind of start at 1,000 pounds. By the time you get to a kilometer, they're 3,000 pounds. And so how much nicer would it be if you could stick all your cameras onto a single fiber and run that back to the truck. And, and so Barnfind have made quite, you know, quite good business out of, of, of providing this to sports broadcasters, being able to take cameras, multiplex them onto a single fiber, take that back to the truck, which might be a mile away, rather than relying on you know, half a dozen <coughs> kind of cables, each one cost many th which cost many thousands of pounds. Traffic uh, China. In, in, in Shenzhen, um, uh, Barnfind have uh, four traffic control um, uh, centers um, uh, linked by a, a DWDM ring, they spent the money, um, and the idea is that, that each of those traffic control control rooms, each one could fall offline and the other three can pick up their workload. And I think each one deals with like in the order of 100 cameras. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the power of this, the fact you can have all those cameras on a fiber ring going around between cities. Imagine if you had to do that on coax. How far does SDI go? 100 meters? <laughs> um, but the, the, the example that we like to show people, because it, it illustrates a lot of these, these sort of techniques, is the Dolby 4K cinema net that we built for them last year. Um, and uh, you know, numerous Soho facilities uh, can connect essentially to the grading panel, you know, the, the base light panel, and the, and the big eclipse projector in Dolby's grading rooms. Um, uh, and, and, and the idea was that, that they could, you know, on the last day of a grade, you take the director and the producer to the best viewing room in the world, you know, Dolby and Soho Square, and this is what your footage really looks like kind of thing. Um, and the specifications were, you know, no compression, no latency. Well, of course, you can't have no latency, but, but, but colorists are fussy people. And if the colorist is having to put up with even a frame of video delay between his control panel and what he sees on the display, that's a no-no. And it had to be 4K and HDR of whatever flavor. You know, they didn't know whether it, you know, HLG um, um, you know, or, or Dolby PQ, uh, you know, whatever flavor of HDR and 4K had to be supported. Uh, and the remote management interface had to be brought back to Dolby as well because they provided the, the, the barn find endpoints. Uh, and, uh, 
And as ever, expense is always going to be an issue. Uh, you, you know, the initial investment and also, uh, you know, the ongoing costs, uh, the total cost of ownership. And so we looked at, um, uh, you know, Rydell Meteor Net, uh, and we looked at Everts, and we looked at Nevion, and uh, they all kind of came in as solutions, maybe two or three times more expensive. And so Bonfind has been, because Bonfind, essentially, you build what you need, and you don't buy any more than what you do need. So it's been a fantastic um, sort of solution that we can offer to customers. Uh, and so a variety of applications, you know, Baselight, that's what Technicolor I use, and Resolve is what you find at, uh, at um, Goldcrest. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and the idea was that other grading machines would be supported as well. Uh, and, um, you know, that means that we have to extend different kinds of control panels, uh, maybe the KVM as well. Uh, you know, in the case of Goldcrest, we extend that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Quads uh, SDI. Uh, you know, maybe 12G will become a thing, but if it does, that's just a question of changing out the optics and putting some 12G video optics, which are just starting to become affordable. Um, you know, and I know it's obligatory that every trade show and every magazine says, you know, we're, we're moments away from everything being done over IP, but you genuinely could not have done this project over IP. No matter how much money you threw at it, it was not a project that could have been achieved over IP. <coughs> So fibre around Soho, uh, there is sufficient fibre under West One uh, that the cost of going point to point, even if you go via Volta or Equinix or, or some other data centre, it's not onerous, but, but there are enough point, uh, points of presence, POPs, literally, you know, you walk around Soho and as we've kind of got friendly with EU networks, as we've started to implement this, you, you just recognise where all the cabinets are and there are just probably 100 within a mile of here. Uh, so pretty much any facility, um, uh, you know, for not much money can have their own dark fibre and uh, you know, run straight to their machine room. Uh, when we say dark fiber, we mean a fiber that's not yet been lit up. It's got no other traffic on it. It's not like halfway along the run of this fiber, Virgin Media are pinching a couple of wavelengths to put somebody's 10 gig traffic on. You know, it has to be a dark fiber for this to kind of work. Um, and yeah, Altino, where are you? <laughs> Some, something one of our customers learned um, uh, before his time as an engineer there, I hasten to add. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, a very typical set of things on the Dolby network is, is, is four 3G SDIs, three gigabit Ethernets, and some, some KVM signals, very sort of typical. And uh, if you look at our sort of planning document, that's the way we laid it out in the case of all the Dolby endpoints. You know, you can see where we've got the wavelengths and where we've got the video SFPs, how they all lay out. Um, <coughs> three networks necessary because... Uh, when, when, when you're using Baselight, for example, the Baselight host, the little PC that sits in the edit suite that, that has the, the big blackboard controller connected to it and the keyboard, mouse and displays, that pixie boots from the remote Baselight. So we need a solid gigabit connection back to that Baselight uh, with very low latency. Uh, and, so, and so one of the networks is for the Baselight um, host boot. Uh, the Dolby CMU, um, uh, so if, you, if you've got a, a PQ workflow, um, where you need access to the Dolby uh, Color Management Unit um, and also the Barnfine Management Interface. That, that needs to be brought back over the network as well. But um, uh, that, that's me. I, 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 you know, I, I invite any questions now. 9.45, we're, we're bang on time. That's good. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so uh, there's a bit of further reading. I, I, I know I've banged on about Barnfine and you know, there are other manufacturers around, but they're, 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 their Barn Guide, uh, currently at version 2.8, which you can download from their website, is just 100 pages of you know, fibre knowledge. Occasionally, the Norwegian English translation is humorous, but, uh, <laughs> but, it's, but it really is a bunch of good information in there. And, uh, and you know, there's lots of stuff on, the, on, on our blog as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there you go. So questions, if you like, uh, pastries, if you don't, and uh, thank you very much. Um, does the barn can you remote manage those uh, uh, Not these Gen 1 2015 ones you can't, but the current gen you can. Right. So the, 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 starting at the Barn Mini 05, they have the remote management interface in them as well. What can you do remotely to them? Uh, you can interrogate the SFPs, you can um, uh, load firmware, that kind of thing. Can you do things to the signal? For example, no. the audio embedded within it? No, 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 no. Uh, no, I mean these are pretty dumb. The, these are just essentially two SFP holes. Okay. This one happens to be populated with a video SFP that's exposed as two BNCs. Right. Um, but the barn minis are <coughs> a few hundred quid, 
you know, they're, they're basically to break out yeah. back to copper signals. That's what they're for. Um, in terms of the, the, the chassis, obviously, you know, the, the world is your lobster, the oyster, and you can um, and you can do lots of management things in there. You can break out MADI, you can re-embed channels of MADI onto SDI. You know, basically anything that makes sense in the chassis, you can do that through the um, through the uh, the Barn Studio interface. And can you do a mix of capabilities within those units? So half of it's doing something on the IP domain, and the other half. Is doing Absolutely. If you, want, if you wanted to put some embryonics, uh, and Barnfine show this at trade shows, you can put embryonics um, 2022-6 SFPs in there, yeah. and you can absolutely route and carry Ethernet traffic that's carrying um, uh, 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 video uh, via it. Can you do timestamps? It won't. It won't. It's not a PTP clock at all. It won't, it won't get involved in any of that. Right. You can lock it to PTP so that it does switching on frame boundaries, okay. and you can lock it to video so it does switching on fr on on video field boundaries. Um, but it's um, you know it's, it's kind of only so much you can expect the router to do from a processing point of view. Okay. Um, I mean, the nice thing is that it, it will let you do it will let you do silly. It won't let you do silly things. So it won't let you route video to an Ethernet output if it's not a. Uh, a 2022-6 capable video output. You know, turning video into Ethernet is traditionally the job of a media composer, isn't it? You know? um, but uh, uh, you know, things like routing, routing video to an audio output makes sense because you know you can de-embed some audio from the video. Mm -hmm. you know? Routing a video output, an, a, an, an SDI output to an HDMI uh, input to an HDR, uh, HDMI output makes sense. You know, and the conversion goes on inside the SFP. That's really good. So, it's, so if you've got YCBCR data coming down the the coax cable. And you want that to appear on an SFP in the suite, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and you want that to light up a, an RGB only um, television, mm -hmm. you know, it'll do that, that conversion goes on kind of thing. Um, so, uh, okay. so, I mean, what, another nice application we found for this was at MPS, who are a digital film facility, you know, D-Cinema deliverables. And I don't know if, how much you, you know about uh, the way um, D-Cinema encryption works, but essentially, if you have a do -Re -Mi server or a, a Dolby DCP series server or a Clipster or something like that that plays out 4K into a digital cinema projector, so, that, so the media block inside the projector needs a network connection to arbitrate the keys, you know, because it's all encrypted and, and you, know, you can't play out stuff that isn't allowed. Um, now, Dolby, in their infinite wisdom, said when they set the standard that it would always be a 192.168.0.0 X network, and that's the end of it. And so most Dolby DCP playout servers and most projectors all have the same IP addresses. They're predictable, and the idea was that in a cinema, the server and the projector have a single bit of cable between them, and that's the end of the story. If you're MPS or any other digital cinema facility and you're routing servers into rooms, well, what can you do? You can't connect them all to an Ethernet switch because you've got a bunch of things with the same IP address. You know, uh, and that makes no sense. And so most digital cinema facilities, they patch it. They have to manually patch it. And much to the chagrin of the projectionist who has to run down three flights of stairs to, to get to his, you know, encryption uh, patch panel. Uh, but MPS have got uh, this entirely populated with RJ45 SFPs. And that's how they route their encryption. And they do it with black magic panels. So I'm in projection booth number three. And I want to pick up do re -mi number two. You know, I'm doing it on a panel rather than having to run down to the machine room and patch it. So it was, it was an application we'd never even thought about. And it was only when we were explaining it to Andy Howard at M MPS that he said, oh, could we do this? And we said, well, yeah, I suppose you could. Um, so again, it's, it's another application we never really anticipated from, from, from something like this. Uh, it's worth mentioning that if you're on net with the unit, they've now and uh, happy to do a kind of month by month rental as well. We do that in a couple of facilities. And so they, they're all, you know, they're all just dug into the building. So instead of the classic 36 month contract, they're actually happy to do it on like a project by project basis now. Is that uh, late breaking news from last night? Is hmm? that late breaking news from last night? It's it happened twice yeah. now. Okay. Wow. But if you're, on, if you're dug in, they, they don't really care anymore. They do it on a monthly basis. So again, you can pop this up if you're on there, a four-way project to then shut it down again without having to kind of argue with the boss that you just, you know, all three years worth of fine water for a kind of three-month project. Wow. The thing that some customers have found hard to sort of fathom is they say, yeah, but how much bandwidth have we got to our bay at Volta? 
well, don't even think about bandwidth. You've got as much bandwidth as you need, you know? It's like how many channels of optical connectivity have we got? You know, well, you can have 12 SDIs and a 10 gig network for your storage, you know, for your avid Nexus, and you can have, you know, one gig for the, for the management network, another one gig for the, for the phones, because you put your phone server out in the data center as well. And when you start to consider the cost of wholesale electricity, you know, at Volta, a cooled kilowatt hour at Volta is cost you a darn sight less than it does in Soho. I mean, like a fraction, yeah. you know. Um, so, so sticking sticking all your gear at bays in a in a local data center, you know, or a data center within 80 kilometers of your building, um, uh, makes an awful lot of sense. And, and in a lot of cases, it's cost neutral from day one because of the amount of electricity or the cost of wholesale electricity. I mean, I'm sure as facilities engineers, you all know how much you're paying for electricity. Probably something like 17p a kilowatt hour, but you know, that's expensive compared to what the wholesale cost of electricity is and, the, and, and combine that with the cost of cooling it. You, you, know, you, you burn a kilowatt hour of electricity, you've got to spend almost a kilowatt hour of electricity to cool it back down again, stop thing catching fire. So, so a cooled kilowatt hour is quite an expensive item if you're in Soho. If you're in a data center who's buying that stuff wholesale, it's a darn sight cheaper. In Soho brownouts. <laughs> <laughs> Plus you've got, yeah, you've got yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, Equinix, you know, they've got like four mains feeds coming in from four different companies at all four corners of their building, you, you know, so, so you can crash a truck into and you can collapse half the building and, and the rest of the cabinets still keep working, so. Thanks, Phil. Jolly good. Thanks,